Third, I grew up in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, my mom married a high school sweetheart. She had a bunch of kids and we're living in the house. And I watched my dad beat up my mother for many years. And they call it domestic violence now. And I watched that both my mom. I went to school and kids would throw rocks at us on the bus because we were trying to get education. At the time, black kids weren't supposed to go to white schools. So they used to throw rocks at us and call us niggas. And when I came home, I asked my father, I said, Dad, why are these kids throwing rocks at us? Who are white people? Because I never met them before. And I said, what do these names mean? I need you to ask yourself, if you were my dad and I walked up to you, or your child came home from school tomorrow and said, Mom, what does this name nigger mean? What do you tell them? Mom, Dad, why are these kids throwing rocks at us? What do you tell them? We're looking to you for answers. That's your job. So I'm standing and asking my father, what do these names mean? I've never heard them before. And he's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, looking for an answer. And he walks away. He didn't have an answer for me. What I didn't know is my father grew up in a time where they threw rocks and names at him too. And my grandfather told him that's just the way it was. So when they moved to another city, they thought it was going to be better, and it was just something in the past. A lot of us have what we call unresolved trauma. It's never an issue until it's an issue. The fact that my father got rocks thrown at him as a baby going to school was no longer an issue because he's now a grown man. But when it happened to his children, it became an issue. And he didn't know how to deal with it then or when it happened to me. So we're going to want to talk about unresolved issues today, unresolved trauma. One day the rock stopped. I don't know what happened. They figured it out. One day I came home and dad was gone. My mom got tired of the meetings and she put them on. Single mom, six kids living in the city. You know the story. If not, it's on Netflix. And so we bounce around, we go to a new school, and at the new school they find out something about me that I can't read or write. So they put me in a thing called a dummy class. But I sit in a dummy class where kids can't read and write and they don't teach us. And that's just the point. We're not going to teach these kids that it's going to be dumb. Luckily, a teacher took, I don't want to say pity on me, but she stepped up for me and she helped me. She pulled me out of the dummy class and she said, you're not a dummy, you just learn differently. And she took the time to teach me my learning style. Her name was Miss Oliver. And Miss Oliver did the greatest thing anybody's ever done for me. She taught me how to read when other people had walked away from me. So I want to ask you, we all went to school somewhere at some point. I knew, who was your favorite teacher? when you were in school. Mine was Miss Oliver. Who was your favorite teacher? Yell it out. Put your hand up, yell it out. I'll take that. There was somebody who stood up for us a long time ago and they helped us become who we are. I didn't become who I am just because. Along the way, people helped me. And Miss Oliver helped me learn how to read, which made it, I didn't understand that. I missed that dress. I missed, how did I miss you? The most colorful dress in the room, yes. Mr. Delfina. Mr. Delfina. Miss Oliver just gave me a chance. She did one part. You know what she did? Her job. Her job was to teach kids. She, her job wasn't to separate and pick one of Her job was to teach kids, and she said, I'm teaching him. And she changed my life. By the time I got to middle school, sixth grade with the bigger kids, I found out they were poor. So I stopped stealing and I stopped selling marijuana after school. I didn't live in London. I mean, excuse me, Amsterdam so it wasn't legal. <laughs> so I couldn't do that in answer that. But we sell marijuana. I made $30 a day selling marijuana. And it was enough to buy clean clothes. It was enough to buy clean socks, enough to buy food. And I started playing the trumpet in the sixth grade because the teacher made put me in a bed. And by ninth grade, when I'm 14, I'm in high school with the big kids. My friends came to me and said, Andre, playing the trumpet is stupid. Black kids don't play the trumpet. You can't do anything with that. You should get rid of the trumpet. I said, no, nah, I'm good at this. I love playing the trumpet. And they told me, either get rid of the trumpet or get rid of us. I'm 14. These are my friends. I can't abandon my friends. Even though what they're saying is mean and not right. So I gave up my trumpet. And what I didn't understand is that trumpet was my dream. It was my purpose. It was my life. Without it, I had neither purpose or drive. So I drifted. 
And I went from a trumpet player to somebody who was in the street every day to I wound up in court one day and the judge sent me to prison. When I went to court, he, he gave me 105 years and they sent me to a state prison in Massachusetts. When I got there, I was scared, just a little bit. If you've never seen a prison movie, they're scary. They're even more scary when it's you. So when I walk into the prison, I'm scared. I said, well, I'm just gonna fight the first guy I see, let him know that I'm a fighter. And when I go to the unit, the guy says, hey, Andre, I put my hands up. It was my friend Melvin from the dummy class. He said, man, what took you so long? We knew you was coming. <laughs> I was like, he's like, man, we all, he told me all my friends that I knew on the street, he said, man, everybody from the dummy class was at the prison. Everybody from the principal's office that got in trouble was at the prison. Everybody from juvenile probation at the prison. Everybody who quit the band, quit football, quit track, quit leadership, quit the church. It was a reunion of everybody who quit on life. They sent us all to prison. Yes, we committed crimes, but the one thing we had in common, we had all quit on life. So I get there the first day and I'm, so I'm gonna hang out with these guys. And they take me in and I'm hanging with my gang. And for six years, I do exactly what they do. I get in trouble, I fight, I get in trouble, I fight, and we just run around and do nothing all day. And after six years of doing nothing, following my friends, my first reason for being with them was made sense. I wanted to be safe. So this was safety for me. Then six years later, I woke up and I realized I was past safe. I was in stupid space because I was just doing dumb stuff. But I had become what we call the king of nowhere. And I said, I'm the king of nowhere. Nobody cares that I'm the top gang leader in prison. It means nothing to anybody. So I came up with a different dream. I said, I want to be successful. I don't want to die in prison to nobody. So I said, I'm going to go home, go to a school called Harvard University, and I'm going to become successful. <laughs> 